What's up, guys? This is Chris Albert Palmates. I'm here with uh, Keegan Gill. We just recorded an episode of the Warrior Soul podcast. And Keegan was a U.S. Navy fighter pilot. Um, he went through a high-speed injection. Uh, high, I keep saying injection. <laughs> injection. Uh, and um, went through some harrowing experiences. We go through that on the episode. What I want to talk about right now with Keegan is is about the actual ejection. Um, what was that like? What, what was going on uh, during the ejection? Because you told me it was pretty wild. Yeah, so um, we were practicing air combat maneuvering. Um, I was fairly new in my squadron. I had just gained my qualification with the Jehemix helmet, which is like a big space helmet. Everywhere you look, the, the displays go for your weapon systems. Uh, anyways, I was kind of distracted. Um, trying to use that system to engage the other guy in his jet and shoot him down for pretend uh, for training and uh, kind of got distracted didn't realize the altitude and airspeed I'd gotten up to um, and I made a mistake in short but uh, we were at about 12,500 feet at the merge that was the point where we kind of crossed paths and I didn't realize how fast I was but at this point I was over two miles above the earth still so it wasn't like I was real close to the earth but uh, I decided to go nose low with the jet, thinking that was fine, uh, not fully realizing how fast I was. And as I accelerated through bullseye nose low, I was approaching the speed of sound and a system in the jet basically said, um, it thought there were bombs on the wings when there weren't. Uh, and so it limited the amount of G I could pull. So I went from a really strong seven and a half Gs on my body all the way down to about four Gs and that, felt like you know my head went from weighing with the helmet like 200 pounds and now all of a sudden that weight was just lifted that g-force was lifted so to simplify it was like going around a sharp corner in a sports car and then having the steering wheel kick back halfway and this all happened in a few seconds uh so i went from the situation that you know i would have definitely broken the hard deck and i would have definitely you know that would have been a huge debut point it would have been a serious issue but this kind of override in the system that happened with the electronic control system. Uh, you know, I had the stick in my lap pulling as hard as I could. And even with it in my lap, I just realized like the jet's not turning. So this all happens in a few seconds. I pulled the throttle back to idle. I put out the speed brake. And within a few seconds, I had the ocean rushing up in that ground rush sensation. So I was at 51 degrees nose low uh, in a dive like that at about 2,000 feet and realized I wasn't going to get out of this. Uh, so I pulled the ejection handle uh, and when I came out into that airflow, I was going uh, 604 knots of indicated airspeed. That's 695 miles per hour or 0.95 indicated Mach, which is 95% of the speed of sound at 2,000 feet. So that's basically the sound barrier. Uh, and when I came out into that, hit that with my body. A normal ejection is pretty violent because it compresses your spine. Uh, guys get all sorts of neck injuries and things like that. This was exceptionally violent, being well outside the envelope for a safe ejection, but really no other alternative other than I would have been dead. Um, and so when I came out at that speed, you know, it was, a, it was like hitting an explosion, a shockwave. Uh, a 695 mile per hour shockwave. If you've ever stuck your arm out the window in a car going 70 miles per hour on a highway, the way it yanks your arm back pretty hard. Well, imagine going 10 times that speed at almost 700 miles per hour and that parasitic drag acting on your body is exponentially more powerful. So 100 times stronger that force acting on my body. So it ripped my helmet off. Uh, I got a TBI, a brain injury from my head smashing. I broke my C1 in my neck. I broke my left scapula. Uh, both my upper arms, my left and right humerus. Uh, my right humerus ripped through uh, my brachial artery in my right arm. I broke my radius and ulna in multiple places in this arm. Uh, in my lower legs, uh, I broke the tib fibs in both lower legs. So I had two open fractures. I'd lost big chunks of my bone that came out uh, from my legs. And this is in January over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the water temperature at the nearby buoy was 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so we're wearing dry suits because we're flying over the ocean in this temperature, but I had ejected so fast that it, it ripped my dry suit mostly off, uh, my arms and my neck, the cuffs of it ripped open. It shredded off a lot of the gear off my survival vest. And luckily my parachute opened it, uh, 
slowed me just enough before impact with the water that I didn't die on impact of the water, uh, with impact of the water. And then we have a sewer system, which is basically a salt water activated charge that's in the, in the, in the harness on our vest. And what that does is when you, because uh, in high speed ejections, upper body injuries are so common, a problem is you can't reach up and disconnect the parachute manually. So these charges, the way they're supposed to work is, you know, they detect salt water and then they fire a little charge and it disconnects your parachute for you. Well, you know, for whatever reason, the, uh, the sewers and one fired, but it didn't disconnect. And then the other sewers didn't fire at all. So now I'm in the water, freezing cold ocean water. Um, you know, it's the kind of water that stings your skin. It feels like needles going in you, it's so cold. And my parachute then sunk under the water and became a sea anchor and just started pulling me under with the ocean currents. And if you've ever been held under by a big wave surfing and you want to get a breath of air and you can't, uh, that's basically where I was at for about two hours, in and out, just getting yanked under the current. While having all those injuries that you just described. And bleeding out and, and, and kind of a crazy twist of fate to it. The, the dry suit filled up with cold water and you know I was dying from hypothermia. Um, but because of that cold water, it actually constricted the blood flow because I was bleeding out pretty rapidly from my brachial artery and both my open leg fractures. And they said, had my dry suit not torn open the way it did, I would have bled to death in my dry suit. Um, but basically spent two hours getting teabagged, uh, in and out of consciousness, inhaled a ton of water, uh, and eventually uh, a Navy H-60 Seahawk helicopter showed up from HSC-28. They were doing uh, actually a weapons exercise down at Navy Dare, North Carolina, uh, with some Special Forces dudes, and they were like, change the plans. There's a Navy dude in the water, we gotta go save him. Uh, they showed up on scene. Uh, again, I, I'd been in the water at this point about two hours from the best I can get from everybody that was involved. And uh, they ended up pulling me out, um, getting me up into the helicopter. They didn't really realize how bad I was until they had me lift up my arm to take my blood pressure and my arm flopped in half <laughs> right here. Oh God. Uh, they took my core body temperature and they said my core body temp was 84 degrees Fahrenheit. So I should have been dead from hypothermia uh, and a lot of other things, but they were able to get me to Norfolk General Hospital, uh, Centera in Norfolk. It's a level one trauma center. And they had the freaking dream team on that day. And those surgeons uh, were able to reconstruct my body. Uh, re they did vein grafts. They did all sorts of implants of steel plates, screws, rods, titanium stuff. And uh, yeah, spent two years rehabilitating and, and went back to flying super hornets again. Yeah, yeah. We just recorded uh, about an hour long podcast. We go through Kagan's story. It's not just that ejection and, and, and the story of coming back, but also coming back some, from some crazy experiences after that because Kagan was dealing with traumatic brain injury for, for a while afterward had to deal with all the implications and repercussions because of that. And uh, that's why we're here this weekend at the Warrior Angels Foundation 4x4x48. Four by four by um, and uh, we're gonna be publishing that episode very soon. Um, just wanted to give you some insights into the injuries that he was dealing with because his story is one of the craziest stories I've heard. And there's so many of you out there who have similar stories to this, whether you were a pilot, whether you were an infantryman, whether you were just on the ground serving, um, there's so many people out there. So, Keegan, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, and, uh, dude, you're one of the strongest people I've met. So, you know, keep going and keep keep pushing on this journey. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys.